exactly in ecology and evolution, so I'm a mixed bag. And then a lot of my professional career uh, was spent doing government relations, which is why uh, hence this session uh, to share some of my background knowledge about the, the processes behind the scenes, as well as some of the, of the things that, you know, if you, if, if for example, if you, and this comes to the um, reason for this agenda, if you have your own, um, uh, goals and if you have your own, uh, if you feel very strongly for pushing certain um, things in, 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 in society, you, you've got to kind of know the landscape, know the science technology policy landscape, um, so that, you know, in the words of Louis Pasteur, you know, chance favors the prepared mind. If you know, if you know the rough layer of the landscape, when you see things in the landscape as you are, as you are traversing your life, um, and if you have a goal of influencing policy, you want to be aware of these landmarks on that landscape and, and to say, aha, you know, I need to pay attention to such, such and such and such if I wanted to um, influence some change. So that's one of the uh, uh, goals of this uh, tutorial, right? To, to give you a broad sketch of the landscape. Now, what uh, I like to say, what's out of scope? I'm going to take a very much kind of just the facts, ma'am, uh, approach to, to this tutorial. This tutorial is largely about policy and not politics. Those are very different things. Um, and so in, in this introductory tutorial, this is only an introductory tutorial. Now, things would, I would do things differently if this were a graduate school seminar class where we could do a lot of discussion, but this being a tutorial, uh, we will not be delving into uh, the good and bad of specific policies. And of course, again, um, I, I would I would I would beseech everybody to not get into any politics when you um, discuss or when you ask your question. That I, I don't think that's that's a, a, a something that it's amenable to this forum. All right. And so, what I like to see, you know, for those of us in, in, in this group, since we are a technology associated group, what you see on the screen are some four or four errors that you might see in regard to what is out of bounds and out of scope. Um, for, for this discussion, right? And so with that, I'd like to um, have assign you all into different breakout groups, um, at, which, which Susan uh, uh, will, will, will help uh, execute. Um, the, the question that you will ponder in your breakout groups for three minutes is when, when we say science technology policy, what does policy mean to you? And, and I, I, I pose this question because there are slightly different flavors of policy that each of us have in our minds. And I'd like to hear what your thinking is regarding policy. So we, we're going to break up into uh, breakout groups um, of four, I think. And I'm sorry, and we're going to have four minutes, not three. Everybody here see the link to join your breakout room. Laura, I will move you to a room in just a second. Katie, Jason, do you see a link to, Anne, do you see a link to join a breakout room? Um, if you are in a browser version, you can feel free to have the conversation here in this main room.
I will put you in a breakout room right away. We are having just an opening discussion. Great, thank you. Did something pop up to join a breakout room? There you go. We are in breakout rooms. I will assign you to a room in just a second, although we'll be coming back very shortly. So if you want, just stay here actually. Um, I'll assign you to a room for our next um, breakout activity though. Hello. Welcome back. Uh, I, I hope you had a quick chance to discuss what policy uh, means to you. Now, um, the, in, in the next few, like in the next one minute, in the chat window, um, in the Zoom chat window, it would be great if you could share what others in your group said about policy and what they felt policy meant to them in their work. Could, you, could, could we do that for just a quick, like a minute at the most? And I'm gonna take a look at what you guys are responding to. So Denise says, policy connects the science to an actual decision-making process. Okay, Denise, hold that thought because we're going to talk about that um, towards the end of this uh, presentation when we, when we talk about the uh, Clean Water, uh, Clean Air Act. I keep saying Clean Water Act. When we talk about the Clean uh, Air Act. Uh, Rebecca mentions uh, regulations again. Uh, Re Rebecca, keep that thought. Again, we're going to mention that in the, we're going to discuss that in the context of the Clean Air Act. Uh, Laura, Laura Sarah, Laura Sarah. Uh, describes that it says this prescription of things we must do and procedures of how to do it. Yeah, we, we had, so Laura and I were in the same breakout group and um, it is interesting that more than one person in our breakout group talk about, mentioned the word procedures, which to me suggests a step-by-step -step thing. Again, we're gonna address that towards the end of the um, talk. And let me just randomly pick out one last uh, response. Anthony Arendt says, putting our science into action so that stakeholders can benefit from what we have learned. In fact, yes. So Anthony, with regards to what you mentioned, um, we're, we're, gonna say, we're gonna see how that science is, uh, I wouldn't say uh, how, how that science is encoded into various policy documents uh, throughout the whole process of policy making. Right? So we're gonna, we're gonna go through that. I mean, just make, make uh, let me just say one last thing. Uh, so Susan says, taking science and connecting it to society expectations, enforcements, enforcements is critical, and funding for priorities. So, um, um, so uh, Susan has a leg up on a lot of a lot of us. Uh, Susan, 
came from a, 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 a past when she has had to deal with things like that, especially things about funding. We're going to talk a little bit about, about funding, just a little bit, all right? So with that, I'm going to continue with my presentations. Uh, and this is the agenda, right? Um, and some of, some of you have already seen this uh, on, on the um, Word document. We're going to start with a, a, an idea of from an idea to an agency that flings stuff into space. So here we're talking about NASA and ESIP. We're gonna do a very quick history of ESIP. Uh, this part where uh, we're gonna talk about Minecraft, you know, for those of you who have kids, I, I don't have kids myself, but I, I know that uh, lots of kids love the Minecraft game. So we're gonna do a Minecraft US government, USD, um, where you- Brian, kind of Brian, did you mean to share your screen again? Oops, I thought- Oh, sorry, Thank we're, you. we're not seeing it right now. Uh, yep. Thanks, Steve. There we go. Thank you. That's why we, <laughs> it's important to have folks like Steve and Bill and Erika who can just jump on me and knock me on my head. Um, <laughs> so this is what we're going to go through. I think I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend too much time uh, describing the agenda, except to say that um, where my cursor is hovering over Minecraft, U.S. government part one, part two, Q and A and R. Now we, we have ample opportunities for Q and A and for our provocateurs to help me reflect what is what may be inherent in your Q and A. All right, so um, we're going to reserve some time for us to discuss things. Okay, with that, let's uh, click on to the next slide where we talk about um, how NASA started from basically an idea and. You know, nowadays we have NASA flinging stuff into space alongside um, private companies like SpaceX. So if you, whoops, let me back up. Uh, if, you, if you look at this swim lane diagram, the swim lane diagram has respective roles for different entities in the science policy process. You have the NGOs, you have uh, entities in the executive branch, and you have entities in the legislative branch. By legislative branch, of course, broadly speaking, we're talking about Congress. Now, we're, we're going to focus mostly on the U.S. federal government, although the discussion here, of course, can be applied um, to the state level as well. But here, um, U.S. government, uh, at, uh, when we talk about legislative branch, we're talking about the United States Congress. Executive branch, we're talking about everything under President Biden and, and below that reports up to President Biden. Biden. And NGOs, things like you know, us, uh, ESIP, right? Now, um, so back in 1912, we're going to start here. Uh, as an NGO, the, the Aeronautical Club of America had championed the idea of a national aeronautical laboratory. Now, um, by no accident, this guy, but I know of Captain Irving Chambers, he, he was a US Navy officer. He, of course, was a member of the Aeronautical Club of America. And he had been advocating through the club, through through pamphlets and, and articles, you know, that he had been highlighting the need for such a national aeronautical laboratory. Now, Captain Chambers, uh, as, as, as a staff member of the US Navy, of course, he had in mind that he realized that the Navy needed, the Navy itself needed uh, an aeronautical laboratory capability, which is why uh, he, was, he was promoting the idea. And in fact, um, Captain Chambers actually did write the outline the strategy in the US Navy report. Um, so this is under the executive branch. Now, um, eventually the multiple conversations and multiple people stepped into, into, the for, in, in, into this foray. Uh, the Smithsonian of, of all places, the Smithsonian um, had a role to play in, in, in um, reinforcing this idea from Captain Chambers. Uh, essentially because the Smithsonian had some capabilities itself of, of aeronautical research. And this goes back to Langley of all things, right? Um, so ultimately this makes its way up. The idea of the National uh, Aeronautical Lab made its way up to um, President Taft, Howard Taft, um, which appointed the National Aerodynamical Lab Commission. Now this is important here. The idea of a commission here, which is presidentially appointed is important because um, this is a very common practice even nowadays. So for those of you who are familiar with something called the Evidence-Based Policymaking Act, that's how, that's how the, the, the Evidence-Based Policymaking Act became law because um, there was a piece of law passed very late in President Obama's uh, tenure 
that authorized the creation of a commission. The commission recommended uh, how this national evidence-based policy making act should be enacted, right? And, and so that's how uh, things are ha things happen. Uh, sometimes the president will appoint a high-level commission made up of government and non-government um, folks. So the commission and echoed uh, Captain Chambers' strategy, but with one difference, it, it actually advocated for an independent, <clears throat> excuse me, agency, right? Uh, in, in terms of this national aerodynamical lab, excuse me. Now, when 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 this idea was pushed over to Congress, <clears throat> the reason why I I, I I raise this point here is Congress refused to authorize the continuation of this commission, right? Uh, co Congress said, um, essentially, we are not going to give you, you, the president, funds to continue operating this commission. Now, this is an example where um, the executive branch didn't quite do a good job at communicating with Congress its intent. And... Um, the, the real reasons are up for debate, of course, but um, sometimes, uh, very often Congress might feel uh, left out of the picture if it feels that the executive branch had gone too far ahead, right? And, and so this change, so the, the Congress refused to authorize the continuation of this, com this commission. Things changed when uh, Secretary Walcott, Walcott of the Smithsonian um, uh, came onto the scene. Now, Walcott, who used to hate the USGS, by the way, for those our USGS friends in, in the crowd. The, the, the Walcott um, was a good communicator. And so again, for those of you in the audience who um, think about communications and effectively reaching across to different constituencies, Walcott was a good example. Walcott communicated effectively with Congress. He, he brought congressional members into the idea of this National Aeronautical Lab. And in 1915, so 1914, start of World War One. In 1915, right, um, uh, Congress actually authorized the creation of NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics (NACA). The way that it was created was it was tacked onto an appropriations bill. I'm going to talk a little bit about stuff like that. Uh, very often, what happens in Congress is that you know some uh, either House of Representatives. Uh, member or a senator crafts a bill, and, and then eventually that that language gets swallowed up in a larger piece of legislation, which is how uh, NACA uh, was born. It was tacked onto the appropriations bill. And for those of you who are keeping track of things recent happening recently, um, and, and this is of, of course in interest to ESA, um you, you, you heard about the whole deal with the National Defense Authorization Act and, and how there was a presidential veto and how the veto was e eventually overridden. Now, the National AI Initiative Lab was part of that big National Defense Authorization Act, again, which was originally vetoed, but you know, Congress o overrode the veto. But the National AI Act started off on its own and then it got sucked into this larger bill. Um, so, you know, it, that, that bears a resemblance to how things like NACA was, was created uh, in, back in 1915. Anyway, to roll forward the clock really fast, uh, 1958, Congress finally passed the National Aeronautics and Space Act, which authorized the creation of, of NASA. In fact, NACA was uh, absorbed into NASA, right? And this, this bit that I'm showing on the screen here is how ESIP came about. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact date, it's kind of hard to figure out. 1993, 1994, uh, Congress expressed the need uh, for the review of, a review of US GCRP. US GCRP is important. Uh, I'm, I'm going to mention it later. It's the US Global Change Research Program, which a lot of us, either as individuals or, or as agencies, were involved in. Right. So Congress expressed the, re the need to review the US GCRP and NASA's mission to planet Earth and also the NASA's Earth Observing System, EOS, right? Uh, the National Research Council um, recommended a federation of partners. And it, in fact, that's how ESIP uh, came to be. And ESIP was incorporated as a 501c3 in 2001, right? And, and so uh, this is how we came about. But the, the one thing I want to highlight to you in this picture to take away is the respective roles of the NGO, so ESIP now as an NGO, 
um, I, I would argue that we are play an essential role in fomenting ideas. And I, I believe uh, uh, Ted Haberman years ago, you know, he was the one in, in an ESA meeting who said, yeah, this is a, ESA is a great place to foment ideas. And so like the aeronautical club, who knows what ideas are fomented in ESA might eventually make its way into legislation and finally into law. And I'm gonna highlight uh, a quick example in a while of how ESA actually did that, right? So moving on forward. <clears throat> Brian, can I jump in here? Yeah, and ask sure. Just a quick question. I don't know if you want to be interrupted, but uh, where does the private sector, just quickly, is it, it looks like private sector doesn't have a role here, but I, I'm skeptical of that. Is there some place where it does? Fit? Oh, yes, exactly. It has, in fact, um, in one of the, um, and Erika might be asking this question because she already saw the slides, but <laughs> so Erika knows that there's actually a role for private sector, uh, and I will highlight that. Uh, specifically uh, or in, in the form of a framework that I'm going to present to you. But um, in case any of you, and I bet many of you are wondering of the same question as Erika, um, you, you can place the private sector actually in the same box as the NGO, uh, except that of course the private se sector through its lobbyists here in Washington, DC, um, have quite a, quite a bit of power right, in, in influencing policy it, and it, um, so, let, yeah, it, the, the, there's a messy conversation to be had about the role of money and, you know, the private sector in, in policy, not politics, but policy. But let's not um, get into that. Well, it's an at, interesting conversation. Ten, 10 seconds. Sometimes it's the private sector that's innovating and demonstrating the potential to do mm -hmm. something novel, I, you know, maybe some of the genomics work that really came out of academia and the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you, you do see at increasingly in today's environment, the initial innovation is coming out of the private sector. And then that may raise questions about, are there policy considerations? You know, should mm -hmm. there be some policy addressing both the opportunities and possible risks? that are posed by a new technology or a new scientific discovery. And, and in fact, you, you see that nowadays um, with, with uh, the, the discussion around the role of Facebook and uh, social media and should they be regulated um, by Congress. And so that's, again, a good example of things starting off in, in, the, in, the, in the private sector. And, and, and your AI issue as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, uh, moving on. So. That was the genesis story of NASA. So let, let's talk a little bit about, compare how NASA and ESIP came about to how things like USDA and, and NSF uh, came about. You know, so as you saw from NASA, you know, started off an, from an idea from an NGO and then a commission, uh, you know, uh, a commission stood up by the executive branch and then finally Congress said, yeah, yeah, okay, we'll, 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 we'll give it to you. So these... So NASA has, uh, that, that creation of NASA, which is authorized through Congress, is, can be broadly said to be that, it, it, that, that NASA has an organic act. So there is actually an act of Congress, a piece of law passed by Congress that authorized the creation of an agency. That is the same way that USDA and, and NSF were born. There, there were organic acts of Congress and the acts are shown here on the screen. But, um, the, 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 the ways that EPA and NOAA were created are slightly different. Um, the EPA and NOAA were created using uh, executive orders, right? Now, uh, that, that was a, and, and again, I don't want to read what's on the screen, but EPA and NOAA basically clobbered together <laughs> from existing entities with, within existing government agencies. But, um, and interestingly, interestingly enough, um, there used to be this thing called the Environmental Data Service, I guess, in the good old days. Um, but one, one technical, technical point of note is to say that even though the EPA and NOAA were created using executive orders, the, the president, President Nixon at that time, the president was authorized under law to reorganize government. So the act of reorganization itself is authorized by law, but the creation of these agencies are a little bit special in that they were created using executive powers of, of the US president. And of course, in the 1970s, um, 
these are the major environmental uh, laws that were passed uh, uh, in, in the 70s. And the, the early 70s were notable for things like the National Environmental Policy Act, you know, NEPA, NEPA. If, if you hear of things like environmental impact statements, that's where NEPA comes from. Or, or nowadays, you, you see something like uh, CEQ, the Council for Environmental Quality. That's where CEQ came from, NEPA. And Clean Air Act, which we're going to talk about later, Clean Water Act, uh, and a number of things like even Superfund and all that. So the 1970s were um, notable for things like the EPA and, and, and things like these environmental law, where a lot of your science gets embedded into. So we're going to talk about your science later. Right? Um, the US, no, sorry. And, and having, uh, sorry again. So we, we talked about the executive branch and, and uh, we could spend a lot of time on this. We don't have time. So I'm going to blow through this very quickly. What you see here on the screen is a high level overview of the structure of the US government, right? Um, I'm only talking about the executive branch, of course, but in the next slide, as you might have seen, we're going to talk about um, the legislative branch. Again, uh, Congress, Article 1 of the Constitution, the executive branch, we're talking about Article 2 of the Constitution. So this is an Article 2 um, perspective, right? Uh, now, under, under, under this perspective, you have um, the executive branches can be divided into your administrative agencies and your independent regulatory agencies. Under your administrative agencies, um, executive departments are things like Department of Commerce, uh, Department of Defense, USDA, Right? And under your independent agencies, that's where NASA and NSF and other agencies lie. Uh, so strangely enough, boards, commission, and committees, for, for those of us who you know, follow along things like FGDC, right? the Federal Data Ge Geographic Committee, that's where the FGDC lives. Right? Uh, the EPA lives under uh, something called the Independent Regulatory Agencies. Now, I, I need to note that um, this definition of what you see on the screen here is defined by... now. 44 USC section 35025. Um, it, this legal citation may not mean anything to you right now. We're going to go in a little bit towards the land of the tutorial to explain what this USC blah, blah, blah is. But what you see on the screen is according to a definition that is implied by this piece of uh, United States code. It's, it's, it's law, right? And of interest, um, a, a related piece of Law under the same section, right, 35502, defines the term open government data asset. So we don't have time to actually get into um, a, an explanation of how do you look up these law, you know, and how do you find all this stuff. Uh, that's for an extended discussion, which we don't have time. But sufficient, to, uh, it suffices to say that um, if you choose to look at it from this perspective, um, this is one representation of the, U, the executive branch of the U.S. government. The other, um, more a simpler way of looking at the, the, the structure of the U.S. government is to simply lump all the executive departments into one bin and then to say anything else that is not executive, executive departments are independent agencies, including the, including the U.S. Uh, EPA, NSF, the boards and commissions. You know, so that's another way of looking at it. And you, you may see this other method of looking at the US government of just lumping everything under the independent agencies if it is not an executive department, that's fine too. Now, this pick, this uh, org chart here does not, it does not say, it does not dictate who is in the president's cabinet. That varies from administration to administration. So under the Biden administration, for example, OSTP, which is under the, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, the director of OSTP has been elevated to a cabinet officer uh, position, which is extremely unusual, uh, which is great for science, right? And so having talked about the, uh, the uh, Article 2 agency, we're going to go back to Article 1 uh, of the Constitution to talk about uh, the U.S. Congress. So this is a view, um, the, 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 this, is, uh, this is east looking west. So I'm where my cursor is this east. West is here, uh, re reflecting pool, Lincoln Memoir is up here, right? So this is how we're orient this is how this map is oriented. Um, on the side of Congress, the, 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 the north side of Congress are, uh, is where the House of Representatives, so these are the three House of Representatives uh, buildings, uh, Rayburn, Cannon, and Longworth, 
right, these are the three. Uh, this here, this thing here, oops, let me just scroll on slide. Um, and, and, and this thing here, number seven, building number seven and building number five, Library of Congress, all right? Uh, Supreme Court is building number four. Uh, and of course, this side of, of the Capitol complex is where uh, the Senate, we, we don't have time in this discussion to talk about how Congress, the congressional committees are structured, but uh, it, it, it bears to keep in mind that uh, the appropriations committee, which everybody's interested in because that's where everybody's money flows from, right? The, 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 the other, com the non-appropriations committees uh, have this thing called authorization power. So they may say, okay, you know, we authorize the creation of NASA or we authorize the creation of NSF, whatever. But the appropriations committee, those are the folks who actually allocate the, the monies to, to operate these agencies. And so the uh, appropriations agencies have a, a little bit of outsized role. And as, as a result, um, in, in the US Congress, so where, where you see the Capitol building, um, the, for example, the House Appropriations Committee offices are right here. They're, they're really close to the center of the, um, of the US Capitol. Uh, and and, and the, the other committees, like under the previous Congress, the Science Committee, on, on, well, the House Science Committee, they were relegated to an office actually outside. It's here, not even within the main uh, Capitol complex. They were out here in, in, in a funny little building. Anyway, um, where, where offices are indicate kind of their power. And, and so, of course, the speaker has an office here. I mean, uh, House of Representatives speaker, Speaker Pelosi has an office here. Um, the, the, the House of Representatives chamber is here. And, and of course, the Senate chamber is here. And like I said, the, the Appropriations Committee office is right here, uh, just outside um, the House chamber. And, and of course, it, when you again look back at the Constitution, of course, the, the House of Representatives has an outsized role in, in appropriations because all appropriations must start in the House of Representatives, right? So that's the role of the Constitution. Um, Congressional Research Service, actually it's part of this thing called the Library of Congress, right? The Congressional Research Service has great reports. Uh, it, it is part of the United States Congress and they do um, a lot of policy research and they are, the, the policy research reports are actually readable. So, and, and they do, do a bit of science research also. And again, the reports are readable. Um, they used to be, the, the reports used to be exclusive. They weren't secret, but they, the CRS, the Congressional Research Service, did not publicize the reports on the website. Nowadays, they do. So you can actually surf over to the CRS and look at their reports. Uh, very interesting reports. The GAO, Government Accountability Office, is what you might think of as the investigative arm of Congress. Um, their offices are not here in the Capitol complex. Their actually offices are off-site. Uh, but again, the GAO... Uh, produces great reports and uh, a lot of times what happens is that a congressional office will ask the GAO to look into a problem. Uh, again, things like the CRS and the GAO, they're nonpartisan. Um, lots of great professionals. I, I admire the people who work at CRS and the GAO. Lots of great professionals working there. Uh, that there are, and uh, like I said, great reports, right? So that's just briefly um, Article 1. So. The takeaways from this part of the presentation is uh, keep in your, in, your, in your mind the role of NGO advo advocacy, right? Um, that we, we as ESOP even or the private sector, or we, we have a role to play in shaping policy because um, uh, as the folks in the room who are federal employees know, um, that there are restrictions against you know, federal employees lobbying, but NGOs, uh, again, we don't have a totally free hand because there, there's a, a lobbying, there, there lobbying act that some call call the LBA, the Lo uh, Lobbying Disclosure Act, that constrain NGOs' role a little bit in, in advocacy. But there is a role for NGOs in advocacy, um, and also the role of government commissions. And very key, the third bullet: that respect for the roles of the three co-equal branches of the U.S. government. I'm gonna go into that again towards the end of the talk when we talk about regulations and how things that like the Supreme Court steps in and slaps people on their hands when, when they overstep their bounds, right? And uh, we're going to discuss this at greater detail 
uh, to, uh, throughout the talk about the different policy instruments that can be used to enact change. Um, Non-legally enforceable documents are things like National Research, uh, National Research Council reports, right? Those are great policy documents to encapsulate what is the best possible way uh, to move on and, and to make changes. But they are, of course, they have no legal force. The, the legally enforceable instruments that you have seen, and just we should have had two examples of it here, uh, are, are statutes, acts of Congress, essentially acts of Congress that have been signed into law by the president are called statutes. So that is a legally enforceable document. And also presidential directives, well, specifically, um, th th this is, uh, again, uh, presidential directives like executive orders actually have the, have the force and the effect of law. So you can be sued, Department of Justice can um, uh, persecute somebody if they break, uh, if, if they violate a presidential directive or of course statutes which are law. Okay, we'll go into this a little bit uh, towards the other parts of the talk. Now- Can I jump in here just a second? Yeah, um, sure. Brian, I'm just, when I looked at your takeaways, one thing that really stood out to me was that it seems like the NGO, the nonprofit, it maybe in maybe private sector advocacy is a place where somebody who is you know like a scientist or somebody kind of on on their own you know like I'm not involved for example in the government in any way um, and so it seems like maybe that's the opportunity for you know kind of the, the typical sort of researcher scientist to be able to impact policy and to and to make an impact. Indeed and, and also um, the typical scientist will be involved in things like workshops uh, even at the federal agencies. And we will see an example of this actually with the Clean Air Act about uh, workshops. Either workshops, even at the National Research Council, they have workshops, but they are the, the, the roles, the <coughs> amount of contribution that as a scientist uh, that, that you can contribute <coughs> to, it, it's kind of limited depending on the context. Right? If I just quick time check, uh, it's 11.42. Yeah, we're running behind. Okay. So let's, um, let's, let's launch into this part of the, uh, the uh, it, this is a Minecraft, right? This is our first um, breakout. Well, this is our first Slido activity where we will turn to you and ask what's going on uh, in your head, right? So Minecraft, US government, you know, it, it, it's a rift of Minecraft Earth, where instead, instead of Minecraft Earth, we're talking about Minecraft U.S. government. How do you build your own U.S. government, right? And we have this annoying little paper clip from Microsoft saying, "We are looks as if we are trying to play Minecraft." Nope, don't want you. Um, so uh, that there is a Slido that uh, uh, poll that I'm going to activate, and that Slido poll can be found in your in the agenda document, but it can also be found uh, under the Kiko Chat tab. Uh, and so if you give me a second, I'm going to activate the slider. The poll is live now. And what you should, and I'm going to pull up on the screen in case you cannot find it. If you scroll down, uh, your, if you're if you on your Kiko chat screen, on the slider tab, you should be seeing the first question active now. Let me know if you don't see uh, the question. So far, I have uh, one, per, one answer coming in. The, the question is, what is the pressing science technology need that would benefit from policy formulation at some level of government? And in case you want to take a peek at what other people are talking about, you can look at your screen. <laughs> Data sharing. AI equity, climate change. Data management is key infrastructure. Ooh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting one because it involves money. Uh, data management is key infrastructure. Anything that involves money is... Uh, Any, 
and, and as you answer these, keep these answers in mind because we're gonna have further activities based on your answers. Physical storage funding, that's also another um, interesting one because of course, anything that deals with infrastructure uh, uh, requires money, not just for capital costs for construction, but also maintenance and operation costs going forward. And, and so uh, anything that deals with infrastructure tends to be tougher. Um, and and, I, and I, 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 I need not tell you how important those um, infrastructure are to our science community. Data-driven decision-making, okay, opt-in, uh, opt-in. Don't know what you mean by opt-in. Oh, it seems like they don't allow up to 40 characters. They don't? Yeah, they stop, I think, short of that, right? Uh-oh. I think. Uh, sorry, it may, may be my fault, the way I set up the call. Sorry, Mia Koppel. Okay, um, Before, yeah. let's, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna give you guys a, a warning, a 10 second warning. I'm gonna move on to the next question. But again, keep in mind what you put here because it's gonna come into play later. Okay, I'm gonna uh, pause this poll and ask you the next question, um, which is a multiple choice question. No. How, how can this, how can your need be met? Um, do you need to create a new government entity or a policy to foster better coordination between existing entities or something else? Okay, I think we have, it, it has roughly stabilized and um, roughly two thirds in favor of uh, policy to better foster um, coordination between existing entities. Um, and also, and one third to that it, it's something else. It'd be interesting to hear from you during the second breakout, what that something else you think is. Um, and that there, is, that there are some folks who think uh, that a new government entity uh, is, is required. Okay, uh, again, 10 second warning if you have uh, any other opinions. Otherwise, I'm gonna move on to the last uh, poll. I tell you what, um, for the sake of time, we, we are running short. So I'm gonna stop the poll here and carry on with the rest of the presentation because we will have another chance uh, at a five minute breakout for you to uh, elaborate further on your uh, questions, uh, on your answer, sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's uh, move on to the next line. Whoops, I'm um, sorry, I forgot. Let's get in our provocateurs, uh, Steve and Erika here to reflect a little bit on what you saw. Maybe what I'll do is I'll bring back on the screen um, the answers, oops, can I look at the answers? Um, if Steve and uh, Erika, if you want to come back in and uh, reflect on the answers as well as, I'm going to look for, start looking for questions uh, coming in from you guys online. If you could put your questions in the chat, or if you want to come, um, come onto the video live and ask your question. Steve, Erika, do, do you want to start off with any reflections that you might have. Uh, tell me if you want me to switch to question two to see the answers. Yeah, I could have make a comment about the question too that, you know, I think that kind of follows up on that point about, um, you know, not to yeah, toot our own horn, but you know, that the importance of communities like ESIP or maybe it's, you know, I think it seems like we sort of agree that we don't really need something new. We need more better connection between what it is that we're already doing. 
Um, and something I think that also like I just, you know, that came to mind as well is like why we join these communities like ESIP is, you know, I think oftentimes we join these scientific communities because we want to showcase what we're doing or exchange knowledge or learn something new. But, you know, but sort of just reflecting on what you presented, Brian, it makes me think that um, why we could be here is more because we do want to impact policy and how can we do that? I think that's why a lot of us are here at a session like this. Um, so for me, that's sort of like an aha moment. And I'm, I'm just going to reflect on um, question one for a second. And you know, I, I was the one who put plastics pollution in there. And the reason I raise that is science is uh, telling us that there's, you know, a tremendous amount of microplastics in the environment, and we're kind of at the, oh my God, stage right now where. We're seeing them everywhere, even in the Antarctic, you know, at the highest mountain peaks. So this stuff is in the air, it's in the water, it's in the soil, um, it's going up the food chain. But we have no idea, I would argue, what to do about it right now. We don't really understand the health and environmental impacts, although we're worried. And what, you know, what should um, society do about this issue? It, to me, that's a policy question that is being raised by, you know, science by what we're actually discovering is going on. So I, I you know, I, I just think it, it's a good example of how uh, research work can surface potential issues that may uh, merit some kind of robust policy response. But then you have the question of, okay, what is the right policy response? Are we going to ban all plastics? You know, <laughs> is, are we going to uh, try to innovate to invent something that eats all that plastic uh, out in the environment? So uh, just a couple thoughts on that thing as an illustration. And, and don't forget that um, when we talk about policy and impacting policy, as, as Ann Wilson, I believe that's Ann Wilson in, in the chat, Ann W. Hi, Ann. Um, if that's Ann Wilson, and, and um, if we're talking about influencing policy, uh, <laughs> we, we also need to talk about influencing policy at, at, at kind of local scales. We'll focus here mostly on the federal policy level. And towards the end of the talk, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how, to, how people tend to influence policy at the national scale. Um, it, it might be interesting also to think about, and I'm, I'm no expert in this, nor do I have materials to think about influencing policy at local scales and how that might build up to national scales. Well, and that kind of surfaces um, the whole citizen science um, development. So it, it has been largely organic so far, you know, more of a bottom up development although the you know there has been some policy there is a little bit of government that i guess you could call it promotion of citizen science right mm -hmm. but okay. um thinking about is there any higher level governmental role or would that just get in the way you know of promoting the uh, use of citizen science to achieve societal benefits is a question and, and and I, I, I don't know, Steve, if you mentioned this because we're, we're going to bring out a citizen science example. Or, <laughs> but good segue, Steve. <laughs> um, so uh, lack of, we're, we're pressed on time. So let me move on to actually talk about this exact thing that, that, that Steve mentioned about citizen science. Uh, next part, we're going to talk about examples of science and technology and policy about exactly how how you can inject your science and policy at various levels. By various levels, I mean various policy levels within the US government, I mean, at the national level. Again, we we're not equipped to talk about the state level parallels to what we'll cover here. Now let's move into that. Uh, before I say that, here's a review uh, of what we just did um, when we talked about um, Article 1, Article 2 of the US Constitution, where we have Congress um passing laws which are legally enforceable but one step before congress we, like the aeronautical clubs like ISIP and and various societies even like triple a s agu 
um, the agenda setting, all right, um, and even the National Research Council, all right, uh, workshop seminars, how, how you can set the scene for policy change, the, the role of Congress and the role of, of the executive branch. And remember discussions earlier in NASA's history about, you know, uh, each of these entities, Congress, especially Congress and, and the executive branch, um, there's always the tension between uh, these two branches of government, which is great um, because you have to constantly ask the question, uh, is it, are you overstepping your bounds and are, are, you, are you exerting uh, too much undue influence? So that's the question that, that we will face and, and we will have to struggle with for, for a long, long time. Um, but if you look at the time horizon here, with, we, we're looking about what we're talking about, like policy instruments that are developed, um, even as Congress is making laws and even as the executive branch is, is executing to fulfill the law so that there is actually a, a, a distinction between, this was taken from a paper, agenda setting from, every, from the world writ large. Um, what we should do for data management, for example, that's our agenda setting, uh, agenda setting. Legislating is where Congress steps in and says, okay, you know, you guys have been telling us through your agenda setting that we should be doing this. So Congress legislates. Executive branch implements. Uh, we're going to get into um, something called regulatory law uh, later in, in this uh, uh, discussion. But the instruments, the different instruments that, that the Article One institutions have, the Congress has statutory law as its instrument. The, the, the executive branch has the regulatory law as its instrument, as its way to, to say that Congress, you have told me as the executive branch what you have authorized me as the executive branch to do. The way that I'm going to carry out your authorization, Congress, is through writing regulations. And that, that, that process is called rule making. So very important distinction, um, statutes and regulations. Those are two different things. They're all law. And as you can see here, the sources of law, you have the constitution as the Supreme Court, the Supreme law of the land. And that is laid out in Article 6 of the Constitution, right? The U.S. Constitution, Supreme Law of the Land. Under that, you have statutory law, means stuff passed by, passed by Congress. And underneath that, regulatory law, things are executed by the agencies. And this messy thing called case law, which we're going to really quite go into. But reflecting back to what Erika uh, uh, had said about um, private sector roles, this is where uh, we will go through this diagram towards the end of the talk, but there is a role for NGOs and the private sector um, to play a part in policy coalitions, for example, that are sometimes very often part of the agenda setting uh, 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 column here. All right. So this is kind of the big uh, picture landscape. Now, uh, keep that picture in mind because we're going to come back to that framework a couple of times. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on this, except to say that now this is statute passed by Congress uh, to actually authorize the creation of the U.S. Global Change Research Program, the USGCRP. And as you can see here, why, why, where I wanted to point out the science embedded at this level, for example, excuse me, it's under section two definitions. There is a definition for global change, uh, definition for global change research, and so on and so forth. So. Um, we don't have time to read through the exact words here, but just to give you a rough idea of that this, that science, if you consider the science, and I do consider the science, this is where science gets captured at, in, in statutes that Congress passes. Uh, and something that I will say here and I'll repeat throughout is that um, the, 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 the level at which science is captured in Congress tends to be pretty high level. But as you work your way down to the agencies, that's where a lot of the details get fleshed out. Um, and, and this is to allow, for example, uh, the, 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 sci the, be the latest available science to inform what the agency should do. This is something that we'll look at uh, under the Clean Air Act um, when we talked about uh, EPA and how the EPA takes into account the changing landscape of science and ozone in particular. Again, the one thing I want you to point out here is 
um, the funny citations, 15 USC 2921. I would explain that a little bit here uh, later, but I want, wanted to call that to your attention. And on this screen, uh, harking back to uh, Steve Young's mention of citizen science. So this screenshot here is actually a screenshot of a Word document that was passed uh, to me by one of Senator Kuhn's um, staffers a few years ago in 2015, where Senator Kuhn's office had reached out and said, uh, do you guys have any uh, comments? And this is the actual screenshot of the Word document. Uh, I was a member of the ESA board at that time. As you can see, uh, Tamara Ladley, I was also a member of the board at that time. And so she had uh, also commented on a couple of things that she saw lacking in that language. And so um, roll the clock forward a few years. Eventually, um, this was actually signed into law. Well, uh, it, it underwent a lot of permutations and, uh, the, and, and, and changes. Um, the places on the screen here, which you see highlighted in pink, are the places where actually uh, ESIP's contribution survived into law. Um, and and, and to, to, to say that, you know, at, at least we, we had a part to play uh, in citizen science and crowdsourcing in authorizing agencies to use citizen science and crowdsourcing as a way to conduct science. So this legislation, this statute, uh, this legislation was signed into law. Uh, again, the legal citation is here. I'll, I'll go into that a little bit signed to law by President Obama just before he left office. Uh, and uh, remember I said earlier how pieces of law tend to be subsumed into larger pieces of law? That happened here too. This, these, uh, this small little Citizen Science and Crowdsourcing Act was actually subsumed uh, into the American Innovation and Competitiveness Act. And so it was passed um, as a big piece of a legislation. So that, that's kind of an interesting thing that happens usually in, in Congress. Uh, the only thing I want to point out here in, in this discussion about Superfund, which is um, one of the major environmental law, is what you see here uh, in terms of science in this Superfund is captured in regulations. No, so this is different, right? There is a Superfund law that was passed by Congress as a statute. Remember the difference between statute and regulations? What I am showing you here on the screen is a regulation, not a statute. So what Congress does is it, 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 it paints the broad outlines for the EPA for how the EPA should be handling the Superfund law. EPA writes the regulations. You see here 40 CFR. The CFR means Code of Federal Regulations, right? CFR. So this is where a lot of science gets built in. As you can see on the screen, um, there are even numbers here on, in, in the regulations. Upper bound lifetime cancer risk to an individual of between 10 to the power minus four and 10 to the power minus six of using information. So you, you, you don't think, I mean, it's, it's not conceivable. It's not wise for Congress to, some congressional staff to be up in Congress writing numbers like this because these numbers will change. Uh, and we will go into this a little bit later, but um, th that's the risk of putting science at too much of a detailed level in statute because statutes are hard to change. Even regulations are hard to change. So one possibility is to encode your science into something called guidance documents reflected here. Now guidance documents accompany uh, regulations. So you might have a regulation here, 40 CFR 300, 430, blah, 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 blah. Now, this is a, uh, a, a document that accompanies this piece of regulation that explains uh, some of the, more, the details and nuances of that regulation. This is, so this is called a guidance document. The guidance document, um, unfortunately, does not have the force and effect of law. So it is not legally binding, but, but um, we will talk about this a little bit. Um, nowadays, un under the previous administration, um, it, the previous administration passed an executive order that required um, re the, the guidance document to be treated almost like a regulation when you first propose regulations or when you first propose guidance documents. I'll talk about this a little bit. Oh. Um, Clean Air Act. I'm, going, I'm not going to talk about this because we're going to talk about that uh, later in, in, the, in, in the tutorial. All right. Except to say that 
Uh, under the Clean Air Act, the important thing to note here are uh, these things called next, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. Again, this is encoded as part of Regulation 40 CFR Part 50. It's regulation, not statute, right? These are the controlled air pollutants that are controlled under uh, 40 CFR Part 50. We will talk about this later, so let's not spend too much time. Um, okay, let's, let's pause here just for a bit. Just to recap, right? Uh, I mentioned this a couple of times, but it bears repeating here. Um, when you see legal citations, 15 USC 2921, 15 uh, USC 3724, this refers to the United States Code, United States Code, USC, right? What happens is that when, when Congress passes law, becomes statute, uh, it is encoded in something called statutes at large, right? The, and then the bunch of lawyers, a uh, big bunch of lawyers, will, will sit down, take a look at the statutes, and separate parts of the statutes out into different titles and different sections of something called the United States Code. So the United States Code is, is, is organized by titles. Um, so this is where, whenever you see USC, your first thought should be, oh, USC, that means it's related to something that Congress said, United States Code. When you see CFR, 40 CFR Part 50 or whatever CFR, that is referring to a regulatory law managed under the federal agency. So keep that in mind. It's very important because like I said, your science tends to be captured at a high level at the USC and you know the statutory stuff. It tends to be captured at a more fine level under the CFRs and even finer levels in the guidance document which I showed you earlier. So very important to, if you want to know where your sciences and um, which is why I, I chose this uh, illustration of uh, the, the recent uh, craze of uh, where's uh, you know uh, Bernie of course Bernie is right here right so where's Waldo has evolved to, for me into where's Bernie and uh, where's my SMP right? science and technology uh, this is the next part of the discussion which uh, I'm going to go through this very quickly because I just mentioned this earlier where uh, again Using the swim lane diagram that you have seen, NGOs, legislative branch, executive branch, right? Um, you can have NGOs pumping out letters of support or policy statements. Um, so you, you see things like uh, the professional societies, AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. They will pump out a policy statement saying that, you know, we, we, we think something like the Secret Science Act, that's a Secret Science Act thing, uh, is a bad idea. And so that's how NGOs, uh, can create support for a policy position and actually send those letters up to Congress, right? This is how NGOs can influence uh, the creation of bills in, in, in Congress, right? But also sometimes you, you'd see, of course, uh, if you are an agency scientist, uh, like if, if you have internal uh, science publications or even if you publish in an open journal or you publish in a journal, some of your ideas might get uh, included at a higher level in uh, uh, bills high, in, in bills in Congress, and this is because later, as you see, you have science and technology policy fellows working as staffers in Congress, and so sometimes the the staffers get a a, a chance to consult your publications and these policy letters and statements uh, to when, as they craft their their bill. If it passes Congress uh, by, by both houses of Congress, it's signed into law by the the voters. All right, it becomes a statute here, codified into the United States Code. Um, the, the statutes will typically uh, authorize our agencies um, to carry out um, its execution of the, the intent under the law. All right, the, the keyword is here, the intent under the law is, is important. Now, when, when, when for example, let's, to, to talk, let's consider EPA. When, when EPA, when, when Congress passes a piece of law and an EPA is left to execute uh, Congress's intent, the EPA needs to draft uh, regulations. When the EPA drafts regulations, it needs to take into effect other um, instruments that have the effect of law. For example, executive orders and president, things like executive orders, presidential policy directive, those have the force of law and effect of law. So it needs to be taken into consideration when the, the agencies draft the regulation. And then the regu now, this weird little agency called OIRA, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, I'm going to talk about this a little bit, but this is one of the agencies that nobody hears about. It's part of the White House uh, Office of Management and Budget, OMB. Uh, 
OIRA has a lot of uh, role to play in the setting of regulations because OIRA is OIRA, OIRA is kind of the watchdog and the gatekeeper for regulations. It's a very important um, organ of the White House, right? So anyway, there, there's also a to and fro where um, the, the agencies have to publish their intent, the intent to um, regulate out to the public. The, chan the public has a chance through um, the, our, the response, public response mechanisms to make comments. Now the agencies have to take these comments in, into consideration. And uh, after final negotiations with o OIRA, uh, it may be passed as a regulation which, have, which has the effect of law. Which is why, again, this diagram is important here. Uh, United States Code, Code of Federal Regulations that has the effect of law, guidance documents that do not have the effect of law, but um, which contain a lot of your uh, science details are captured here in the guidance documents. So um, with this, we will update. Um, let me just quickly blow, blow through this here because we are really running short of time. Uh, let me talk about this. Uh, this part about regulations, which where most of your science is captured. Um, the, the, the interpretation of what is regulated and what is authorized under Congress in statutes, right? Uh, the, the prime example being uh, CO2 as a pollutant. Now, that interpretation of statutes is left up to the agencies. Now, uh, it, it, and, and this was during the Obama years when, when CO2 was considered by EPA to be a pollutant. Now, that was ruled by the Supreme Court uh, to be legal. Uh, it, the, the, the agencies have the authority to interpret what is supposed to be regulated under them. So it, this is where the, the role of the Article 3, uh, the, the judiciary comes into play in, in, in educa adjudicating uh, these very messy, very complex issues. Again, this thing called OIRA, um, these guys, if you look at the map here, the White House, Lafayette Square, this strange building here, this is where uh, Office of Management and Budget, OMB, and the OIRA staff work. Uh, there are like 500 uh, staff members of OMB, sizable, not big, but sizable. Uh, lots of smart people there. And there's this weird thing called the Congressional Review Act, again, which is a, which is a very cute thing uh, it's a cute loophole um, that can work against science or can work for science. It depends on how you apply it. But um, we don't have time to talk about that since we only have 15 more minutes in this session. Um, you know what? So I'm going to... Well, sorry. This is the upgraded framework which you can take a look at where I have added in this bit of the framework that talks about um, level of science and details, science and technology details encoded in policy as what I've just described, right? And, um, you know, we are running short on time. So what I'm going to do is to recommend that I quickly run through the rest of the slides. I'm going to concentrate. Um, I, I, we do not have time to talk much about the Clean Air Act. I want to leave time for questions. So um, I want to leave at least the last 10 minutes for questions. So I, I only have five more minutes to run through um, a bunch of slides, uh, apologies. We will not do uh, the second breakout, uh, the Minecraft part two, except, and we will run through, we will, I will lead you to this diagram, this diagram here to, to talk about um, the Clean Air Act and how science is encoded, incorporated into the Clean Air Act. Now, this is uh, an unusual example an unusually good example of where um, the law um, has stipulated that EPA shall review the state of science every five years when EPA is considering the pollutants, these the six so-called six criteria pollutants, including ozone, which we don't have time to really talk about ozone, um, carbon monoxide, and, and four other gases. Now, what you see here in this diagram is that uh, Congress actually uh, said to, to that, that these standards, these uh, pollutant standards should be reviewed every five years. This is the process by which EPA has decided that it's going to review uh, the scientific evidence for updating the, the, constant, the, the pollutant standards for these six pollutants, right? As you can see here on the screen, 
um, there are workshops, there are peer review studies that, that are incorporated into the reviews, and, and there is a structured way in which science is taken into consideration as they formulate policy, right? There is an inter interagency review of the final of the policy assessments that come out here. Um, and there are public hearings and comments. So as, as interested members of the public, where if we are not part of this workflow, if we're not federal employees that have been uh, tasked to work on these issues, there are opportunities for us as members of the public. Um, as also, and also if you are a member of a scientific society, which is what I'm gonna to go to, to next, there are opportunities for members of the public and members for uh, scientific societies to actually um, inject uh, opinions uh, and, and, and your feedback into these uh, proposals by, by agencies. So that's where the science can get incorporated. Um, and again, we're going to look at this just very quickly here. Okay, we re remember this slide. And I said that, you know, Throughout this process of incorporating science into policy, there are opportunities for the public to um, inject their voice. The, 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 one of the mechanisms is through something called the Federal, Federal Register, which is now a website, where uh, the final rules, the final regulations are published, but the Federal Register is also the place where the agencies, for example, the EPA has to, pub, has to publicize an intent to create a new rule, a notice. And so um, folks who are very, feel very passionately for issues, you can subscribe to, to updates, email updates from the Federal Register um, so that you get notified if, for example, the EPA publishes a notice um, that is going to uh, modify a rule or it's going to propose a new rule, right? So that's the way that you get uh, involved. Uh, even uh, presidential documents like executive orders are also maintained in, in the federal register. So as an individual, you can subscribe to these updates. But the one thing that I want to leave you and where I'm going to end this um, lecture is groups, the NGOs and state uh, uh, and, and even private sector lob lobbying firms and uh, your pro uh, professional societies, a lot of them will subscribe to federal federal register notifications so that um, people get a sense of when something is coming up, right? And so this is where you, as an individual, right, uh, your professional societies like AGU, AAAS, uh, and so on and so forth. I'm only listing a partial list here, of course, including uh, now this uh, CRA, the Computing Research Association, strangely enough, tends to have uh, very interesting updates that you can sign up for email updates. And you know, uh, if you're interested in things like uh, compute infrastructure or even privacy, uh, privacy, some of the data privacy laws, uh, the CRA covers some of this. Um, I'm gonna highlight an another one, another place uh, in a slide or two that covers things like this. But for our early career scientists who are listening right now, um, the Congressional Science Fellowships offered by places like AGU and American Chemical Society here and, and AMS. It, it's a way uh, for our scientists to get uh, uh, into policy making. Uh, for example, a Congressional Science Fellowship, they will place you in congressional offices. Um, now, Congressional Visits Days uh, are organized by places like AGU, um, where they actually organize teams of scientists to go up to Capitol Hill to, to talk about uh, various issues. Um, I was, I was one of the co-founders very early on on this thing called Climate Science Day on Capitol Hill, uh, where we yank scientists up to actually congressional offices to talk about climate. Um, this one is great, AAA Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. Again, if you're an early career scientist, or even, it, it, it doesn't matter actually, even for experienced, uh, even for experienced uh, uh, um, employee, I mean, if you are not an early career scientist, um, it, you are you 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 do stand to apply to for uh, AAA science and technology policy fellowships. Uh, these have placements, for example, in in the federal agencies. Um, uh, again, there's a whole slew of these things. I, I wouldn't go, go into those in great detail, but um, the the way for you to maybe interact with public policy, one possibility is 
seriously have a conversation with your professional society's uh, public policy office or the government relations office, as it's, as it's called sometimes, right? Now, moving on to um, things like other NGOs, like the National Academies, and this is a weird thing called the National Academy of Public Administration that nobody knows about, but actually it's pretty important. Uh, places like Resources for the Future. Now, they uh, influence policy through uh, raising awareness through seminars, conferences, email updates. Uh, but th these, th these are largely think tanks, um, great places. The, the reports from these places are, make good reading. Um, I will not cover private sector government relations or other private sector entities and how they influence policy. That's out of the scope of this discussion. The, the last slide I will show you is um, policy coalitions. Um, no, so the, these are coalitions in Washington, D.C., where you have whole bunches of various different people getting together to promote uh, different policy positions. So for NASA, they have a coalition for deep space exploration, and uh, NOAA has a, has a coalition. USGS also has a coalition. This is the coalition that uh, pushes for NSF funding. And for those of you here, uh, in, including um, uh, the physical samples folks, the Natural Science Collections Alliance is still active pushing for infrastructure. Some of you raised the idea of infrastructure for collections and this, this is where the NSCA pushes for that. And, and this, this thing called the Data Coalition, which pushes for um, privacy laws and, and uh, uh, somebody mentioned on the feedback, uh, something about AI equity and about, you know, for example, training AI to, to, to not, uh, pro to, 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 be, uh, to, to be equal across races. I mean, not, not to flag, um, uh, people of various racial descent, you know, that, that I interpret to be AI quality. And so places like the Data Coalition, they push for uh, such issues, right? And um, that's, I don't want to show that slide, but I think we should leave the last six minutes open to uh, reflections and questions. Um, I have not been looking at the, um, I'm going to stop my sc screen sharing. Uh, I've not been looking at the uh, questions coming in through the chat screen, but uh, I, I don't know if Steve, you and Erika have noticed anything uh, interesting to highlight question-wise. So me and Steve are laughing because the chat has just been blowing up. So there's <laughs> so much interesting stuff there. Um, I think uh, it sparked, this session has really sparked a lot of really great thoughts and you've been nominated for a couple more sessions already Brian. So. oh no <laughs> we, we've issued some assignments uh, to you <laughs> oh no <laughs> i know nothing but steve what 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 should we are there any major questions or reflections steve and erica well well one thing that came up that is of course of interest to me is there's also the international <clears throat> side right which is really a topic in and of itself but just to be mindful that beyond u.s science technology and policy you've got the international arena and a whole range of mechanisms uh international treaties mm -hmm. international organizations like the u.n um <clears throat> You could think of someone like the World Health Organization, which I believe is chartered by the UN, but that's kind of another realm. And to me, it is of interest as I watch ESIP branching out and connecting to other countries besides the US that I think there are some creative opportunities for ESIP, you know, as it builds these international relationships to influence policy at the international level as well as at the national level. And one more thing, and then I'll stop and let Erika talk, but there was also some interesting discussion about the role of um, local and state governments in the mix mm -hmm. also. And it, it reminds me of the old expression, the states as laboratories of innovation, that sometimes you see policy innovations coming from these lower levels of government. And when mm -hmm. something actually seems to work well at a state or, or local level that it gets picked up ultimately at the national level. So Arika, I'm done for now. 
Yeah, no, I was going to also reflect on that about the state and local impact and how that's like a whole other issue and maybe something that's a little more accessible from sort of an individual level. Like I think about, you know, the ways that I can get more involved because we live so much in this virtual world, you know, as, as scientists, I think, and then getting more involved just locally in my own community, I think is something that I personally am working on. But two other things that I noted in the chat was we, we did have some discussion about you know, ESIP's possible impact in policy development and what that looks like. Like ESIP does send out, you know, does create some guidelines around things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is some role in ESIP of like, you know, standing on certain types of values or, or issues that we want to push forward on. So maybe that's a possible thing that we could explore more. And the other one I know from, from Ann Wilson uh -huh. and um, somebody else about the um, what what type of you know what type of new entities do we need and then Dave Jones also mentioned about like a place on the hill so um, so I think there's might be also some things that could be um, you know explored there Dave also mentions that um, that what was that Dave about the climate change is it climate change has now been recognized as a national security risk um, as of today so that's another opportunity so um, I think it does seem like there's something more we could do here, and it seems there's a lot of there's a lot of excitement around it. So maybe we could build on that and 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 try to work towards something. Could could I ask? Uh, I know this is being recorded, so but Susan, to maybe say a thing or two since uh, you guys well you guys brought it up that you said we should do something, but uh, I, I know we I know Susan maybe cannot say anything that is binding on on since this is being recorded, but maybe. To, to have Susan say something, and also I'm going to invite uh, Dave, Dave, Dave Jones also to say something. Susan? Yeah, happy to. I This is a, such an exciting conversation for me. Um, as many of you know, I kind of came from the policy world, so I just get really excited to see the energy and the enthusiasm to explore this direction. My one, um, my one caution or my one, you know, I can't get ahead of myself is that with ESIP being primarily federally funded, we cannot use federal funds to advocate. Figuring out where the line is between educate and advocate um, is a little bit tricky. I mean, if you are just going in to talk to representatives about the importance of data management, and I, I was one who wrote, you know, data as critical infrastructure to anything uh, climate, and educating about that because they probably don't necessarily know that. Once you get, once you have a bill or you are advocating for a certain amount of money, that is advocacy and it can't be done with federal funds. So if you're saying, I want you to support this bill or, or support this specific initiative, that, that turns you into a lobbyist, which you can do. You just can't do it with federal funds and you have to register and disclose. Sim similarly with appropriations, if we were to go in and say, hey, we want to see NASA's budget at X. So, it, but I am, I am excited to explore those avenues, look for foundations and private funding. I think that ESIP could have a really strong voice um, because when federal agencies put in their budget request, it looks self-serving, right? When the private sector goes in and the Amazons and the Microsoft, you know, it looks like, well, they're trying to profit from this. When academics go in and say, we want more money for NSF, it looks like they're trying to get money for them. But I think as a community, can, can, can make those asks and do that education in a little bit more of a neutral way. Um, so yeah, let's, let's, I'm excited to build on the enthusiasm and see where we can take that. Uh, another yeah. point that came out, uh, Dave, give me one second, uh, sure. sorry. Um, but I think Denise um, brought up what we can do as individuals uh, where we're not seeking to represent any entity, but we shouldn't, and Arika kind of touched on it too, we shouldn't underestimate what we can do as individuals to reach out at all levels of government to contact our elected representatives, in some cases participate in local entities, like I'm a member of a commission, not that I sought that job, but I got heavily lobbied. So um, don't, underestimate what you can do as an individual to establish relationships with uh, policy makers. And that can really have a lot of impact. Dave, sorry. Oh, no, no worries. This is a great discussion. I was, uh, I was just going to add that, um, you know, one of the things that I'm also working on, I don't know if uh, any of you know, but I've, for the last 28 years, have uh, helped organize and co-host a weather and climate summit for broadcast meteorologists. And um, 
we've done that in Colorado most of the most of the years and Steamboat Springs for 20 years and then Breckenridge for eight. We're now working on retooling uh, this uh, summit and it's going to bring together broadcast meteorologists, right, who communicate every day. They're the daily science deliverers of uh, information into every household uh, and scientists going to bring them together uh, to talk about the, you know, the big science issues uh, at stake. So uh, those broadcast meteorologists feel more comfortable about talking about science on the air, you know, outside of their comfort zone of there's a severe thunderstorm coming today, or here's the, the daily forecast. Uh, and so we're looking at launching that in 2022. Uh, we have the, the town of St. Petersburg, Florida, very interested in hosting it um, uh, for a five-year commitment. And, um, you know, we're, we're probably going to uh, uh, generate a lot of excitement about that. And, and perhaps there, there are some messages or things that we can deliver in that summit that also uh, motivate the broadcast meteorologists to, uh, you know, uh, include in their uh, time on the air, the importance of science, the importance of understanding changing climate uh, and how it's impacting uh, people locally. I mean, one example in South Carolina, a good friend of mine, Jim Gandy, who was on the air there for 40 years, uh, started a Gandy's garden. And he linked that to climate change because uh, he was he was saying, look, you know, over here, um, you know, these plants are growing larger uh, because of a warmer climate. Now, that might be good, but so does poison ivy, and uh, it's it's becoming more uh, uh, more uh, an, of an irritant to more people because of climate change. When you can connect to people like that one on one, they start thinking, oh well, maybe this you know warmer temperature and all the CO two isn't a good thing. So um, anyway, that's you know we're we're actively involved in in some some good activities. We're also looking to raise sponsorship for the 2022 summit. Uh, and the last time we did it in Breckenridge in 2018, we had 2 million viewers on the live stream. So uh, it was pretty impressive. And I think we can do the same thing and grow that. Because when you get a Jim Cantore or um, Ginger Z from Good Morning America tweeting out, watch this session, uh, people tend to click on that link. So anyway, that's it's a great discussion. So I'm glad I was uh, uh, listening in on this session. Good job, Brian and Steve and Erica. <laughs> Thank you, and Bill. Thank you. And Bill. <laughs> um, so I, I, I didn't... Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Brian, frozen. He froze. <laughs> <Closing> remarks. <laughs> yeah, what can you find? Yes. How can video freeze in a warming <laughs> climate? <laughs> well... Well, definitely, we all thank everyone for participating. And yeah, it was really stimulating. And uh, maybe we'll have some- uh... I want to keep people around if You're back. Brian, oh, you I'm froze. Back. Okay, so I'll, I'll start. Yeah. I, I, I think it's the internet's way of telling me I've been talking too much. Um, no, I, what, what I was about to say was that we are three minutes over. I want to be respectful of um, everybody's time. Um, and, and so maybe we should call this formally to a close, but anybody who wants to stay on um, can stay on. Uh, because like I said, uh, I, I, I've not managed to look at any of the chat and I, I have no idea what you guys signed me up for. <laughs> <laughs> Great session. I hope to see everybody at the plenary, uh, which starts at, I'm double checking, 1.30, I believe. We tried to give you an hour break because breaks were too short last time and nobody actually had time to take an actual break. So um, <laughs> we'll see you at the plenary and then there will be a coffee break um, back in the wonder format um, after the plenary. So um, we can also, have, that is not gonna be as facilitated. So if you wanted to regather around these conversations, you could find um, Brian, Aretha, Steve, Bill, um, Denise, anyone um, and do that in that session as well. Thanks, okay. Thanks. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you.